Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Codex uh, Speaker Series event. Uh, I'm Roland Vogel, I'm Executive Director of Codex, the Center for Legal Informatics. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers to you, uh, Professor Dan Katz and Michael Bomarito, also Professor Michael Bomarito, I should say. Uh, Professor Dan Katz is um, Associate Professor of Law and Director of the uh, Law Lab at Illinois Tech, Chicago Kent uh, College of Law. Um, and uh, and uh, he's a uh, a very, um, he's also affiliated faculty with Codex, I should say, and uh, he's a uh, prolific uh, writer and, uh, and teacher and, um, and scientist who works on the intersection of law and technology. Uh, his uh, scholarship uh, has uh, been published in all the uh, important academic outlets and his work has been uh, covered in uh, major news media. Uh, and, uh, and Michael Pomerito is, uh, is a, uh, uh, Michael and uh, Dan are close collaborators. Michael's the head of research at the, at the Law Lab uh, at Chicago Kent. Uh, he's an adjunct professor of law at uh, Michigan State University and he's a Codex Fellow. Uh, Michael's research interests uh, focused on natural language processing, machine learning, decision science, uh, optimization, visualization, modeling, and policy, especially as, as, as applied to law and finance. And as, aside from his teaching, he's uh, the founder of several uh, companies. He builds, operates, and cons consults for different businesses in legal and financial uh, services. Um, their talk today is, um, is titled Measuring the Temperature and Diversity of the US Regulatory Ecosystem, uh, which is a publication that, uh, I think it's a piece that's going to be published soon in, we'll in science. No, 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 the, that's a different one. That's a different Sorry. one, okay. yeah. Anyways, um, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Roland. So today we're going to talk about that first paper and, and try to see it more general, generally in some work that we've been doing uh, focused on uh, uh, 10Ks, uh, securities filings, and uh, what information, if any, we can learn from those security filings that are produced by publicly traded and registered companies. So uh, in the sort of public di discourse, there's a, a, a significant ongoing conversation about the, the size and intrusiveness of the regulatory state. And I, and I think that if you look at that, that's really one of the grand debates in law and politics. We think that that's not a particularly empirical conversation, and we'd like to try to put some, some contours on that conversation. Uh, uh, by actually looking at uh, a set of documents, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, 10K filings, which because we think that at scale they provide some pretty interesting insight into uh, what's going on, what's important to, uh, to companies in terms of regulation. Um, but more generally, we're interested in trying to apply scientific tools to better inform this and other types of conversations. Uh, I think. Our interests, and I think it's some of the interests of the center here, are in legal complexity, legal uncertainty, and legal risk. Because so we think that um, a big part of the lawyer value proposition is, is linked to working on these three problems. So why lawyers get a sort of outsized, uh, sort of, uh, uh, outsized sum of money is because they're able to provide some ability to, for clients to decompose the, one of these three problems. It's not everything they do, but it's, it's at least an important piece of the puzzle. So this is just a little bit of things that we've been interested in. We've studied the US code uh, and tried to formalize that mathematically. We've we focused on, on looking at that uh, and, and characterizing its complexity, sort of taking account the complex systems paradigm. We recently, last week, published this paper as a general form paper in science, uh, talking about trying to use the tools of complex systems to better understand the law. Uh, so, so this is kind of our background. I would say that we think that complexity itself, in particular, is one of the dominant underlying vectors. So tomorrow is future law, and at least a decent percentage of the conversation is going to be directed towards tools that really help us. The most valuable and successful of those tools are really helping people deal with the complexity problem, the legal complexity problem, whether it's lawyers themselves or whether it's the clients directly or some, some convex combination of the two. And our view is that sort of law intersect technology, process improvement, and design center methods is really, all three of those are really legal complexity mitigation strategies. That we have all this legal complexity, and that's a sort of a feature about the world. One option is to try to directly attack the complexity by like having simpler legal rules, but you know, you, since you don't control the US Congress, your this next best, or the regulatory state, your next best approach is to try to build sort of mitigation tools. And I think that if you look at each of those, 
those three things, process improvement, design thinking, and legal tech more generally, uh, the effort there is often to try to take legal complexity and decompose it in some way and make it more palatable. And again, whether that's a consumer using it or whether that's a, uh, a lawyer or a, a, a small small firm lawyer or an enterprise lawyer working for big companies, we think that this is really the, one of the, the dominant uh, uh, characterizations. So, um, of what's going on in this space. So our, our question today is how can we uh, better understand the sources of legal complexity, uncertainty, and risk? And we looked around, and uh, um, this comes out a little bit out of Mike's interest in particular, being in, both in finance and in law. And this is going to be the fundamental sort of concept for this presentation. So I wanted to get this out on the table. We believe at scale that these securities filings that these companies are required to produce, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a second, gives us at least some insight into the way these legal rules affect the regulatory targets. And I want to explain why, if I can, um, for those of you who might not be familiar with, with securities filings. So here's the presentation in three parts today. We'll divide it up. Um, an introduction, and I want to talk about 10Ks as a data source. Uh, second thing is I'm going to talk about this first paper that we've worked on, measuring the temperature. Uh, uh, and diversity of the U.S. Uh, regulatory ecosystem. And then Mike's going to talk about a paper that's in progress uh, looking at regulatory dynamics and microclimates that we observe uh, that, that, are, that exist. If you think of the entire regulatory system as a complex adaptive system, how, how, how can we get some uh, uh, better understanding of what's going on in that space? So, okay. So let's start with 10Ks as a data source. For those of you who might not be familiar with 10Ks, what is a 10K? It's, an, it's the annual report produced by either publicly traded companies or registered companies. And among other things, it's, a, it's supposed to be a comprehensive uh, summary of the company's financial performance. It's the risks it faces across a whole bunch of different dimensions. The part that we're particularly interested in are the regulatory risks that the company itself identifies. Some action in Congress that has happened or might happen, some decision or action a, regula a regulator may take that they think will affect their business. They are obligated to try to inform the market uh, as to the impacts of these events and how it might affect their business. Now, if you think about it, it's pretty interesting. We have this sort of massive scale coding problem. So we have a kind of distributed crowdsource characterization of a bunch of different companies, and they don't work totally atomistically, but because some, you know, the lawyers from one area, from one company look at the lawyers from other, from other companies. But you do have a lot of different people sort of giving you their take under certain types of legal obligations, which I'll describe in just a second to try to say, here's the, when we look out at the universe, here are the things that affect our business. So I want to show, talk a little bit about that. So, so again, the important thing is that these companies are under legal obligation to file these documents. There's a lot of resources expended to produce these documents. Publicly traded companies must, and those that meet, meet the registration requirements, have to file these documents. And the goal is, again, to provide the market with relevant information to the valuation of the company. So that's what these documents are for. And they're not perfect in various ways, which we can talk about, but they're you know, one of the largest data sources we have to even have insight into these ideas. So among other things, the part that we're interested in, as I mentioned, is the regulatory exposure or regulatory risk that's, that's identified within these documents. And I, I just wanted to make note of this. These are documents that cost quite a bit of money to produce. Some, um, this is a, a statistic we found in our just sort of poking around that the uh, the mean and median is 1.8 uh, million and 522, respectively. It's actually reversed there, I think. But um, Now, the incentives are this. Pe this is how people in the literature sort of talk about it. On the one hand, you can sort of get yourself a form of securities fraud insurance by disclosing risks than, than a person who, who uh, feels like they weren't uh, informed and then buys the stock and the stock goes down. If you've disclosed this stuff, you sort of got yourself, it's not like perfect insurance, but it's, you can think of it, people sort of talk about it in those terms. Like you're getting yourself a sort of a form of insurance. Because if you disclosed it, then a person can't say, well, I wasn't aware. So we obviously create a little bit of a legal fiction that people are actually reading these. Some people actually do. There are traders that spend a lot of time trying to mine these things for insights so that they can trade on the companies. The other sort of countervailing vector, which is really important, a countervailing dynamic here, is you don't want to enumerate every risk under the sun. Because you look like you're, a risk, you're, like you're risky. That you're going to scare investors. You're going to raise the cost of capital. And so you don't see every risk that a company faces written in this document, in these documents. If you were, if you gave, if you really did that in a faithful way, and you were, really thought of every risk that a large company faces, I mean, these documents are pretty long. They'd be 50 times longer if you really took that took that seriously. And I think, you know, for from our conversations, that that's a kind of pushes. That's a, something that sort of pushes the other direction. And so there's some sort of calibration being done between name every risk under the sun 
and don't na name any. And so that's the kind of idea. And I will say it's not a perfect data set, but the goal here is that as a mean field or large scale characterization, we think it provides insight into what's going on at 10,000 feet. Again, uh, at, one, at one foot away, it may look a little different. So on the data acquisition side, you can get these yourself uh, from Edgar. Um, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission maintains a database, Edgar database, and you can download and work with these at scale. We are working on building an open source quarterly index uh, for to support research like ours and potentially products in this space. Um, and so we'll be working on that in the months and years to come. But here's what we have in the data set. 34,000 registered companies, 160,000 10Ks over 1994 to 2016. And the data we have ends in third quarter of 2016, but it could be updated if, if you wanted to take it further forward. So in the first paper, we look at measuring the temperature and diversity of the U.S. regulatory ecosystem. Now this in our view, is like if you landed on the Galapagos and you just wanted to write down what you saw, we think this is, we're just trying to offer a first order characterization. This is an imperfect in a bunch of ways that we can talk about, but we just wanted to say, let's try to do, what is the first thing you would do when you encountered a system? What's the first thing you would do? You try to take the temperature and you try to figure out the diversity of the system. That's what you do when you just landed. You wouldn't, you know, there's a lot of other more detailed things you could do, but that's, a, that's kind of like a first scientific cut on stuff. So that's what we do in this paper. It's a short paper. It's like seven pages long. Or just kind of it's right to the point on those two things. So we want to understand how, how to develop a window into the impact of regulations on companies. So I want to show you how we do, do it in this paper. Again, it, I just want to say I think it's partial and limited in some important ways. Uh, uh, we hope that our doing this, and again, our doing this and, per, and perhaps making that data available might inspire some people in this room or some folks uh, online to uh, 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 hide our, our friends on the internet. Um, uh, or friend on the internet. I don't know how many people are on there, but uh, uh, so friends. friends. Okay, it's plural. There's two. So uh, um, so the the goal in here is to offer this mean field characterization. So uh, so we go across all the 10Ks, and we simply are trying to identify and track the number of references to acts or agencies in these documents. Now that itself is not a trivial exercise to do this identification. Let me just give you an example. We just picked a random 10K this morning that we wanted to put in the presentation. So SunTrust, uh, uh, this is their 2009, they're a bank, SunTrust Bank. We just want to pick a kind of medium-sized company just to give you an example. Here's their 2009 10K. Here's one page of that 10K. Here's the table of contents first I should show you. So this is the, some of the things that are in there. The part I want to point you to is they, in one, an item one and item one A. In item one, they talk about the business more generally and the business risks that it faces. And in item one A, they talk about these risk factors that the business faces across a bunch of different dimensions. So here's one page of that. If you see here, it's a little hard to read, but I'll read it to you. On November 12, 1999, the Financial Modernization and Legislation Act, known as GLB Act, was signed into law. Then it's sort of cut down. The company is elected to become a financial holding company under the GLB Act well-capitalized or well-managed under applicable regulatory standards, the Federal Reserve may, among other things, place limits on our ability to conduct these broader financial activities. That's one example. They're talking about the way this act may affect their business. Here's the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act substantially broadens existing anti-money laundering legislation. It's very costly for the banks, the Patriot Act, because they had all these compliance requirements. And they mention here. And... Um, imposes new compliance and due diligence obligations on the company. So the presence of this law has imposed a cost on them to do all this sort of compliance activity associated with the Patriot Act. Okay, so we have to, there, since this is a distributed problem, lots of different people, you know, the lawyers and accountants for all these different companies are authoring these documents. They don't have to follow any particular standard in writing down, the, for example, the names of these acts. Here's at least five synonyms for GLB that we have out there which is actually the Graham Leach Bliley Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999 is the technical name of the item. But the lawyers themselves don't have to follow that. And here's just, again, five examples. We had, that was a non-trivial matter to actually do this matching of all the different ways people can write this. So that's a big part of what we, you know, to set up all the rest of what we do in this paper. So what we have after we do this data pre-processing is four and a half million of these references across all those documents. There's quite a few of these references and documents, reference to specific acts or agencies which affect their business. So here's the mean field characterization. Two things. One, the total energy in the system is the total references across all filings. The temperature is the references per filing as a function of time. So we just keep track of the temperature over time. Is it growing? 
Or is, it, is the temperature going up or going down as a function of time? That's it. Simple. A lot of things, just counting is, if no one's counted and you count, that's, that's, that's like the first step. So we're doing the first step here. So in this first paper, which is currently under review, uh, version two is on archive and on SSRN. Um, we also did a short write-up in the Oxford Business Law blog about it, if you're interested in a little bit of a write-up on it. Um, we just asked the question, what's the global average temperature across all of these filings and what, as a function of time? And we just keep track. And there's, there it is. Has it grown or has it gone down? Again, there's lots of people say it has gone up. Uh, we'd like to try to see if that's a, there's actually some support for that, and if so, how much, and as a function of what? Yes? Yes, sorry. I'll show you the unique versus yeah. the other. So what okay. you're seeing here includes frequency of reference, not just the initial index. So both are presented in the, in the paper. Yeah. Okay, presumably different information. Yep, yeah. exactly. They don't really, it tells the same story, basically, that the magnitude, the, there's a kind of budget constraint here, and they sort of, they, they both sort of head in the exact same direction. It's practically the same thing, but it, it, we do have both actually in there. Now, I will note that there has been some substantial changes in the requirements, like SOX, Sarbanes-Oxley is here, right in there. So at least some of that is just a function of the change of the law. The reporting requirements have not been static over time. So some of this change is a function of the change in the law. But even after the laws change, we still see these grow this growth in here that's independent of that. Now, we don't partial that out here. That's the kind of neck, that's like the second paper to the fifth paper to be written in here. The first thing is just to say the temperature. What's the temperature in the space? Again, I, I mean, I look around in law, we do a lot of things that aren't really particularly scientific, okay? Because basically say, if you can't write a perfect thing that fits on this tiny story, we'll have the opposite view. Like, we're just treating this as a physics problem, and that's it. We're going to just do it from 10,000 feet. And then we'll leave it to others to do the one-foot version. I'm not saying there's nothing to that, but we don't do a lot of the 10,000-foot version. What has gone on is a mean field sort of statement, okay? So we observe significant growth in this over, as a function of time. The next thing we ask in the paper is, what about diversity? What about the diversity of the space? So the, what we do here is we basically, we do bit string encoding, where we basically say, do, do you identify the act or don't you? So let me show you what that looks like. For each company year pair, we encode one for the presence of an act and zero otherwise. Suffice to say, it's a very sparse matrix. So in this case, the presence of this dot would turn this cell to a one. Now, it's going to be very sparse because most companies aren't affected by most laws. That's just a kind of general property of the system. It doesn't have to be that way. We could have very small set of laws that affected everyone, but the way we structured things is in this kind of differentiated way. So most companies are not affected by most laws. So we have 160,000 of these years company bit strings. And so we just asked in this paper, is the diversity of the system growing or contracting? Growing or contracting? So this is again another directional question. Second thing in. So what we do is we just take Hamming distance off the shelf, and we say, take that mean field characterization. Is the stuff getting more diverse or less diverse? And the way of thinking about it is, are the regulations that affect these companies, is the profile getting more diverse or more homogenous as a function of time? And so here we show a kind of similar story. It's not, it's not totally monotonically increasing, but it's practically monotonically increasing. And we keep track of that over time. And we show that the diversity is also growing. And I think there's, you know, there's quite a bit that can be said about that. We just sort of begin, again, this paper is just the first cut on it. Now, one of the things we think is interesting for the law is that we think this is actually part of a sort of lawyer specialization story that people are sort of beginning to put together, which is what it means to be the lawyer for company A when if you were to somehow switch into company B, the knowledge you have about A isn't going to necessarily help you over at B because it, what it means to be the comp lawyer for company A is getting more and more specialized as a function of time. That's what this diversity idea really means. Now again, if I just randomly assigned you to one of the other companies, maybe it's in your sector or something like that, but if I just randomly assigned you, it's not going to be like it once was, say, when Wigmore used to be able to teach all the subjects. It, we've got a lot of diversity in terms of the, not, the things that lawyers do in the umbrella, and I think, again, that's sort of getting into that. So I'm going, to, I'm going to pass it over to Mike, who's going to talk about part two of this project. So to keep playing on the, uh, the biology 
metaphor here, right? We have Darwin landing on the Galapagos and categorizing some of the uh, some of the animals he sees just at a really high level. We also have like Linnaeus, right? He was the guy who put all of the animals into these different categories. And I'm not here to get into what the definition of an organism is or whether Linnaeus did a good or bad job about classifying those things. But again, in the spirit of just trying to make one step of progress forward here at a time, we're trying to do that in the second paper, where we look at the different kinds of species or the different kinds of climates that we see out there in terms of these uh, microclimates of acts or of regulatory spheres and the, the types of acts and the types of companies. So we're calling this the regulatory dynamics here, which is a phrase that I think has been used but poorly defined in the past. Maybe we're, we're uh, contributing the, contra the uh, conversation there. And uh, this is a paper that we hope to have on archive in the next 30 days. So we're previewing some of the results. And especially on the second half, we would appreciate more, more criticism. The first paper, that's under review. Unless you're a reviewer, we don't, we don't care as much. This side of the, the presentation, um, we'd really like some, uh, some pressure and some criticisms that you have and some thoughts. And so um, the first paper, really high level mean, mean field. The second paper, starting to drill down to that second level. What are the, the microclimates within the overall climate, and what are the types of animals or species that we observe? So we have more of this data collection and processing issue. And in this side of the paper, we rely very heavily on these bit string encoding. So just one more time to explain, we have, um, we have over 400 acts. And if you were a company that had no regulations that apply to you, you would have the vector of 400 of these acts, but every value in that vector would be 0. So you'd have no presence. If you had every act, then this would be, on the other hand, entirely red. You'd have a 1 in every element of the vector. So obviously, as Dan said, generally there's sparsity. Most companies don't experience most acts. In other words, most companies have a few acts. Um, but these encodings allow us to really cut straight to a structured representation of how you experience regulation. Um, in addition to just a, an act in a firm, this is longitudinal data. We have this information over more than 20 years. So we can say, over time, in other words, we have act, we have company, and we have time, all three dimensions that we can use there to try to understand the dynamics and the climates and the changes in the climates. And so, we can really use any of these as the unit of analysis. We can fix time and look at companies and acts. We can fix companies and look at acts and time. Or we can take the other combination there uh, and fix the acts. And so um, what we start with here are different slices of this. You could think of this as a three-dimensional space. And we're slicing it up um, to look at a two-dimensional projection. So we've got act and agencies together. Um, and again, drawing from what scientists have done in other fields, especially biology, we decided to just look at sequencing this. So when you sequence a genome, you have the chromosomes, and then you have the bits or the, the sequences there. We did the same thing here. So in the rows are acts. And we'll come back to the pattern that you're seeing stand out right there. And in the columns are companies. It's pretty cool to see, right? These are 34,000 companies. And I think this is 1996 or 1997, so maybe fewer than 34,000. And every regulation that affects every company at least once in a single diagram. Obviously, you're not going to interpret it directly at the company level, but it gives you an idea. So the thing that you see immediately is almost every company has some shared genetic material, if you will. Every vertebrate has something that codes for a lumbar, right? Or every Every mammal has some virus's RNA that's been just trapped in it for, for 10 million years. So those two uh, acts in particular, now it's, it's a few more, are the Securities Act and the Securities Exchange Act. And in some sense, this isn't really new information here, because as a registered company, in the forms that, that you actually fill out are references to these acts. Now, to your point earlier, the frequency at which you mention these may vary. For example, a broker. A uh, dealer might reference the Securities Act many more times than uh, a mining company because they have a number of touch points in the Securities Act. An important thing here is that the, the findings don't typically cite, pinpoint cite, if you will, um, specific clauses of statutes. In some cases, they may. But generally, there's just this blanket citation to an act as a whole, not a pinpoint cite to a clause. So again, 
there's this shared genetic material looking across the row that we see immediately stand out. Looking up and down a column, we can see patterns, sectors, industries, if you will, emerge in terms of which, uh, which elements are shared or cluster together. And so as to Dan's point earlier, this is a, a sparse matrix. You see a lot more white than you see black in terms of the cells. Most cells are empty in this matrix. And this implies that most regulation does not impact most companies. An important, important point here, and something we are actively working on in what will probably be paper three, is that not all regulation is probably created equal. Some regulation is a page in a clause. Other regulation is uh, 1,000 pages and 10,000 pages of, uh, of CFRs subsequently. Um, so this, uh, this is not all created equal, and we're working on exactly that question. But again, at a high level, you get an idea of what kinds of acts and what kinds of regulations affect companies. So you could think of this in a totally different way. You could come to this from a, a political economy or political science perspective, and you can say, how, what's the life cycle of, of regulation? And how does that translate into impact? Um, and we're going to have to make some trade-offs here in terms of granularity and general, generality, right? So we can say, we can write a case study analysis of every single regulation over time. We can look through the congressional record. We can listen to all that. We can look at every company. Obviously, that's going to be a Herculean effort and, and not really a part of the research agenda that we have. Instead, what we're trying to do is classify these acts or regulations in a couple different patterns. And we're borrowing from physics and biology again here. So you might say, let's, let's fix um, company. Let's average across all companies. And let's see how many references there are to an act over time. Just put on the y-axis total number of references to an act. And on the x-axis is time. Look at this time series signature. What does it look like? You're going to see a couple of these. So for example, Sarbanes-Oxley doesn't exist. Enron happens. Congress does its thing. There were some references before Sarbanes-Oxley is actually enacted because the bill was kind of in draft form and being discussed. And then all of a sudden, it's just like, if you're a registered or publicly traded company, you're citing this at least once in every filing. So this is something that doesn't exist, doesn't exist, evolves or adapts or bursts onto the scene and takes over a, a, at least part of a climate or becomes a, a key element of a climate. We have the Clean Water Act, which uh, kind of mirrors maybe some of the agency aspects here. We're, we have all of the agency data, and it's, some of it's in the paper or, or subsequent papers. Um, so you could say this just mirrors the increasing utilization of the Clean Water Act by public interest groups or the EPA in prosecuting or pursuing action against companies. In this case, we're just seeing only publicly traded or registered companies, but it's happening to private companies too. Um, and lastly, we have this perfect example of Y2K, which was the end of the world for about three years and then has never been referenced since. So uh, we have these bursts. We have these kind of explosions onto the scene that, that remain and plateau. And then we have maybe some more gradual stuff. These are three increasing examples or, or bursts. Um, but instead of reinventing the wheel, we wanted to kind of borrow some of the ideas from existing research. So Riley Crane and Didier Sonnet had, uh, had this paper in PNAS a while ago now where they tried to classify YouTube videos. So YouTube has a lot more data. They were able to fit different kinds of models. It's obviously more fun when you see uh, videos, you may or may not remember the chocolate rain tray on day from uh, a long time ago. Um, but inspired by this idea that we can take the time series signature alone, come up with some metrics or parameters, and classify these acts, we've just come up with a couple simple things. So, so the mean of the different series. In other words, are you increasing or decreasing? And just classify that as high, medium, low. Do the same thing with the variance. In other words, how, how noisy is the process by which the regulations are, are affecting companies? And lastly, we look at something called autocorrelation, which is kind of a, a measure of, do you do what you did yesterday, or do you do the opposite of what you did yesterday? So if you have a positive autocorrelation, you're more likely to increase if you increased yesterday. If you have a negative autocorrelation, you're more likely to decrease today if you increased yesterday. The idea being these three things, again, don't capture everything about an act. They don't capture everything about the dynamics underneath in Congress or regulation or companies or or global politics and economics broadly. But they allow us to quickly put things into buckets. So a little bit of formalization. And here's what we've got. Just high, medium, low for all of these things. Kind of makes sense, right? You have a lot of stuff that decays here um, on the left side. Some decays quickly. Some decays slowly over time. So for example, um, there are a lot, a lot of law about, uh, about cell, uh, landlines, right? That's becoming less relevant over time. It turns out 
we have these cellular things now. I don't know where mine is. But the, um, the traditional usage and regulation of telephones as landlines run by, say, Mama Bell, it just doesn't affect that many companies because they're not using it in the same way. Or we're not using it, maybe, as a society in the same way that we were at one point. On the other hand, we have this stuff that just kind of is in the background that's, that's used generally but isn't changing. And then lastly, we have the kinds of things that we saw earlier that, that burst onto the scene or continue to grow over time, like the Clean Water Act or, uh, or Dodd-Frank or Sarbanes-Oxley. So we cluster these things. And here's a couple quick examples. So this is a um, medium in terms of whether it's increasing or decreasing at the top, uh, a high variance in a positive autocorrelation overall. And you see stuff like the Anti-Kickback Act, which is of increasing importance, the Fairness in Asbestos Injury, which is a fun backronym, FAIR Act. Um, on the flip side, we have increasing stuff here, not just kind of flatline, but increasing, also high variance, high autocorrelation. And we see things like the PPACA, still here. And then uh, SAFE Act, another backronym for the mortgage licensing. So again, we're clustering these into kind of Linnaean orders or, or families. There's a lot of information we're not capturing. But we are quickly capturing kind of the nature of an act. Is an act, um, let's say the CBO or some organization wanted to score prospectively or use this historically to score acts that have been passed and enacted. How do we know whether or not this was a high impact or low impact or high touch or low touch regulation? I don't know. Maybe we could use something like this to help Congress. Not to say that we shouldn't have regulation, but at least we should understand what the prospective impact or retrospective impact of the regulation has been. Um, we, uh, we think that, again, this is going to allow us to really classify quickly the behavioral signature of these acts both in the way that Congress promulgates them and the way that the businesses respond. Mm -hmm. This is pretty basic. I guess that's what Go ahead. It's these 10K reports, which I'll try to go all quickly right. all the way. Back yeah, I know. I just, I just, it's really important. Um, right there. They write these giant documents. Have you, have you ever owned a share of a company I instead of a stock? And you get that giant, giant mailing, or at least you may have historically. If you were to open that up and read that, that nice glossy GE, we're the best company in the world, and here's a $60 printout that says every, all the cool things we do. On one of those pages is all of this enumerated as risk factors. Or in some other sections, they reference this stuff. We've done a lot of work to kind of have computers read through every one of these 10Ks over 20 some years. Look for every string that just says something like one of the acts. Either it's an act that we already know about and we have a database of all of these, or it's something somebody says blank, blank, blank act. Now, there's, there's state acts. There are acts for other countries. We have all of those in the database, but they're not in the analysis because we don't want to get into Canada. We don't want to get into all the weird places where people do business. It is the formal full name. Yep. is. GLB, right here. So right here, this is the technical full name. Now, Congress over time has had a couple different ways of structuring this. But this is the Graham Leach Bliley Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. The string is kind of irrelevant. That has an ID. So this is an act, a proper act. It's got an HR. It was, it's a public law now. It's in the US code, although that's a different thing because it's codified. But all of these are the raw data. We turn them, and this is a lot of the work into a database that has an ID for this act. It does, the string is kind of just a thing that we need as humans to understand what it is. But just trust that every way that everybody's ever referenced GLB, we have in a database cleaned up. OK? Dirk? Just, just a question adding to that is, I imagine you're using NLP to just yes. find all of these. Do um, you have any, because I, I remember in the paper it says um, it was pretty precise and all, but you read it. Recalls, right? <laughs> So we have not analyzed the recall. We don't have an F1, and we haven't analyzed the recall, other than I don't want to think about how many hours we spent manually reviewing it. But we didn't track. At some point, we got to the point where it was identifying everything that we would review in a 10K. And so we would stop, and, and typically identifying too much. Like, I don't care about Guinea-Bissau's Act, Modernization Act, or whatever. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Lots of things like that, yeah. Uh, 
there are a number of, let's say, older theoretical or newer maybe XML-based ontologies for legislation that are global or regional jurisdiction specific. We haven't, we haven't tried to get into that or to normalize our database with that. That's part of why we haven't released the database. Like yeah. It's all on GitHub, but it's not public yet, because we want to go through and make some decisions about, for example, should we actually export all of this in, a, in one of the legislation XML formats to try to maximize interoperability. On the flip side, researchers, to be honest, don't generally care. Most researchers that, that we work with don't even know that there's an XML ontology for legislation. So we're not here to solve that issue. Like we just want to, if a CSV file is going to get people up and running and research, then that's probably what we're going to give people. Uh, everything that you see is run end-to-end -end machine based. Not that there wasn't human inputs and kind of whitelists and blacklists that were developed at some point in the process, but, but for example, every string here that has at least some minimum threshold criterion goes into the next stage and then is given one or more scores that are then turned into final adjudication as to whether or not it's a proper reference to one of the acts that we care about. So we have plenty of of things that are somewhere between a false positive in the proper sense or a thing that's not in the US federal body of legislation that we just don't care about for the purpose of this research, like Canadian or Californian acts. For example, like the Lemon Law, the original Lemon Law, I think, was a California act. And there's like a federal and a California Lemon Act. And the California one like always comes up. So part of the work that we had to do, again, manually at first, but now entirely automated, is I don't care about California right now. I only care about the Federal Lemon Law Act. OK. Any other data questions while we're on this? Go ahead. So and what was your, was your request in that? Did you, did you do it uh, sequence? Did you do entity extraction? Or? We, uh, we have done entity extraction, which is not, I mean, lots of people in the room <laughs> have done entity extraction of SEC data. Um, but like Stanford NER is not going to do what we need for these acts. Oh, you'd so have, you'd have to have your own yep, that. yep, exactly. Which we've kind of produced, but um, we have not trained what you would see as like a traditional NER um, input classifier on this. Probably because we're addressing a really specific question here, and we can kind of overfit to the domain in a way that just plugging it in is annotated text to another. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, but so is it? The code will be hopefully online in the next 60 days. So we, uh, we do all of the things you said and more just to try to get, again, we, we wanted recall to be as high as possible here. So we threw, you can think of it as an ensemble of, uh, of approaches at the problem. Some things are easy. Some things are hard. For example, um, GLB, one of the things that I slipped up on a second ago, third guy's name, Bliley, not Biley. A lot of people get that wrong. Even the CPA or, or attorney that you're paying hundreds of thousands There's of millions of dollars. Kind of yeah. It paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to your attorney to get you a misspelled uh, yeah. there. So, well, so you can do this proxy for anything. Yep. Guess, for, question, on top of. All these big kind of conventions for uh, shortening titles. Right. And that's where we have done some work ourselves. We've also had. I mean, synonym or acronyms are easy to identify, for example, but uh, you could input all these strings into a classifier, train the classifier to say, is this likely to be an acronym that we care about, even in the absence of the word act or agency? I think the bigger picture here is, from a scientific standpoint, the errors are probably gouging us, right? So if we've almost certainly missed more than zero of these potential references. I don't think it really affects the type of conclusions that we ultimately make in the paper. Uh, I think we, a refinement can be done, but I don't think it really does violence to kind of the bigger picture here. Like, if, if you added five references here or there, it isn't going to like change the temperature. Uh, but I mean, again, I mean, that, that, that seems reasonable. But if there's some sort of systematic error, then, uh, yeah, I'm not saying it's this. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, if, we've if there were, that that could make we've probably problem. collectively read right. at least yeah. a couple hundred pages of 10Ks selectively, just the sections that are generally highest, looking for every act, checking against the data set. So I mean, this is part of the reason why our intention is to open source the project as a quarterly index of 
regulation or regulatory exposure and pull, pull request and yeah, commit well, your, uh, I mean, your patch. I mean, that might be yeah. an argument in favor of, of having an Is that not, not constrained? Yeah, no, no. For validation? Right, right. And I mean, ideally, in some sense, we're producing a, uh, a first round of what could be an input to produce a formal, clean, validated, annotated text, but with less effort, right? We can say, go to these. You'll get a bunch of positives right away. Obviously, you've got to look for other stuff and annotate other things of interest. But we're giving you 20% of the body of annotation focus like that. Yep. Hey, actually, it wasn't so bad. OK. So we're over here. We, uh, we're putting these into clusters based on their time series impact. And now we're going to look quickly at, um, at the company-specific view. So we have this matrix. And what do you do with matrices? One of the things you can do is, is build a distance metric or a cluster on them, which we did in the first paper to some degree. And we showed you, on average, if you pick two firms, they are further away today than they were in the past. And that trend is pretty much increasing. So every year, Firms are, on average, getting further apart, like a Hubble constant, the universe is expanding kind of thing. Um, we can take that distance metric, and we can kind of drill down. And instead of just looking at the average pairwise distance, we can look at the distance in a more nuanced way, whether it's clustering or community detection. And so what we've done, just to try to explore some of this and start to put some structure on it, is just start to do exactly that. So the SEC, just quickly on this picture, the Securities, Securities Exchange, Dodd-Frank, those big solid lines here mean that almost every company is connected to almost every other company if you accept or include Securities, Securities Exchange, Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, and Dodd-Frank and uh, um, Sarbanes-Oxley now. So if you just use a simple rule with no thresholding, if you said, if we cite the same act, we're connected, everybody would be connected to everybody else, which clearly is not very valuable. So we've thresholded these by removing some of the key acts that are just kind of baseline information. Like every mammal has this viral RNA. It doesn't tell you anything. You may as well ignore it. So when we do this, we end up with a graph. And in addition to just thresholding these, we know if you share 20 acts, you're probably more similar than if you only shared five. So we've weighted all of these connections. It's not just that you're a friend or you're not a friend. It's that there's some intensity or strength or weight on the relationship between you based on how many, uh, how many connections you share. So Here's the, the fun, pretty picture that you always want to have in a, in a network um, research paper. Right? These are, uh, I think, 2011. And unfortunately, can we flip the lights just for a second? <laughs> just for effect, right? You got to get that. Is it uh, spotlights there? Nope. You, you know, this is your bill. Yeah. There, we, yeah, there we go. So this is the universe of firms in 2011 based on this visualization. You can see. There's a cluster, clearly a core here. And inside of the core, there are these smaller neighborhoods. Now, one of these, for example, is like auto loan trust securitizations. All the asset-backed securities where people put the cars that you finance end up as these simple little trust securitizations that all have almost the same filings. So those end up in this little ball of every Chrysler or whatever auto or asset-backed security. You've got a lot of other stuff, though, where there's nuances of things, where you might have companies like a GE that's really in five different sectors and spans these. So we can zoom in a little bit and, and see more of that structure here. Um, there's a, we're going to have a full zoomable visualization when this is all done. This is just a raster image zoom. But you can see there's a lot of stuff going on. And there's all these little firms that are maybe in the core but are, are singletons in some other sense, and all these little communities. And so it kind of begs the question, what's a sector? Or what's an industry? And can we maybe have some insight into that to some degree? But also a, a much bigger picture, like what does it mean and how, how do you operate as a business? Um, what are we doing when we regulate? What, let's say we could agree on what optimal regulation would look like and do, which is a normative question that we may never do anyway. But if we did that, how would we, how would we get there? Would it be rules that apply based on whether you're a big, medium, small company? In other words, they might be regressive on your size and, and your ability to bear fixed costs? Or do we care about regulating companies based solely on what it is they do? Maybe I want to regulate you uh, because you create some kind of Pigouvian tax or some other negative externalities, and so sector specific. I think in reality, we have both, but not very consistently understood or managed or planned. Right? We have people essentially putting burdens on large entities, say, based on number of employees, 
we have regulation that puts burden on companies based on sector or jurisdiction or all of these other elements that, that probably aren't the most important thing if we were to sit down and say, how would we ideally regulate the entities based on whatever it is that we think regulation should do? So that's our goal in this paper, too, is to really start to help people uh, be able to work towards that. So we're, we're performing community detection. We're working five minutes. Five minutes? OK, we're performing these community. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, so what, so what, 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 what's your theory, though, on why it's expanding? Why is the company there? I think there's a number of theories that we want to try to, to allow to speak themselves and to possibly arbitrate between. So one idea is we're just a more complex society. We have more technology, and we have more variation in culture, and we have more things that we do that we never did before that just need rules and law. And so unless we want to become simpler, right? as society and the economy gets more complex, we need more complex rules just to keep up with some minimal level of regulation. Another version is we have too many legislators and too much time on their hands and too many agencies. And so that's obviously something that's got a, a vocal uh, proponent for right now. Um, I think there are. But it's, anyway, it's a, it's a measure of uh, a greater number of regulations. It's a, it's a measure. And more specific for. It's a measure not just of greater number of regulations, but also regulations that are actually experienced by at least some companies, right? Because there's plenty of acts. Wrote it in this document. Yeah. I, mean, I think part of the question is lots of rules. Most of those rules haven't made it to a threshold where a company's lawyer wrote it in this document. Mm -hmm. And why we like it is some, that, that actually puts a, kind of draws a line and says this is above some waterline of, of being of enforcement. Here's my favorite example, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918. You think that, like, how on earth would that be relevant to most modern day companies? It turns out the EPA and public interest groups have found this as a means of stopping various kinds of, uh, of companies that have environmental impact. And so this is an act that was literally forgotten. It was a treaty that was signed, like, I don't know, some British birders were like, let's have an international treaty. And then it was tabled for almost a, de uh, a century, and now it's, now it's in play again. Go ahead. Or that it, it could be not just a risk of loss, but it could be a risk of gain. For example, tax reform is often cited, not for its negative impact, but as an opportunity or a potential material, not adverse, but a material impact. But, it, but, but, the, but just to get to that threshold, is, is something's changing. It's not that the, the regulation, the existing regulation is static. It's that it's being enforced in a certain way, or the regulation might be changed in the future. So it seems to me that this is a good measure Well, I'd, I'd push back a little bit because there are a lot of risk factors that are there over time for a lot of companies. In other words, your kind of baseline risk profile as measured by the 1A section of risk factors doesn't change that much every year. Banks are going to be listing the Patriot Act for as long as that's on the book. And, and all of the various anti-money laundering and, and financial regulation is, is just there every single year. When it changes, it's especially there. And I think. This is why frequency is important, right? That we have the frequency. We can see not just that it was cited, but that it was cited 25 times in the three years after an enactment when it was phased in. And there were 16 Treasury regulations that were still pending that phased in. And so every quarter, it was a new item that was listed. But then eventually, it was just like, OK, we kind of figured out Dodd-Frank. It's there. We have two to three references to Dodd-Frank forevermore. Maybe not, I guess. But like, it's just there now. It's, it's two instead of 20. I'm just wondering if, you know, if there's somewhere hidden in the data uh, that you know, hits or not or invisible because of the data you're using uh, are, are industries that have a high regulatory burden but are not turning up here uh, because those, yeah. regu the, the, those regulatory schemes are very static. They don't change over time. Companies are identifying those as... We, um, we have a number of other ways that we're starting to pick up on that that uh, will hopefully have some future work on yeah. soon. Well, you can so. exploit the time series. So if it's static, I mean, they got to fill up something in this document. But if it's static, you'd say, what were you this year? What were you last year? What's the difference? So the, then you can say, well, how much difference have you had over time? So you can do that for a time series analysis, also on the company's 
which is kind of where we're about to go now. I think we're One small thing, too, the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act provided a safe harbor for forward-looking statements so that people could kind of say, as Dan said earlier, like, no, 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 dear securities class action, like, we told you this was a risk. So don't come to us with some plaintiff's firm and say that you didn't tell us before we purchased your common stock. Like, no, 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 we said it here. If you purchased the stock, you were on notice that this was a risk. So you can't sue us for that. So there is, to Dan's point earlier, a, a real reason, especially post-PSLRA, why people will, will say stuff here, even if it is just constant static baseline. OK, so like I said, we're doing some of this community detection and clustering in, in the second paper. Here's a, a dendrogram, kind of a phylogeny in the biological sense of all of the acts. Really a ridiculogram. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be prettier. Online, interactive, D3, all that kind of fun stuff. And then uh, um, companies. Companies, on the other hand, are 34,000 companies at this point. So if you think this is a mess, wait until you see what we're going to have to do to present the companies. But, but just stay tuned. So um, at the end of the day, though, this is not just a game where we visualize some stuff and, and complain about regulatory burden. We'd like to get back to some of these bigger picture questions about how we efficiently govern all the different things that we end up doing today, like autonomous vehicles, like we've been talking about here for 15 years. At some point, there will probably be federal statutory frameworks around autonomous vehicles, like we've been talking about with Michael Genezaris for how long here? So I think. Um, if we can stay grounded in the important questions, that'll help. So what matters more, sector or size? Should one of them matter? Like, Do we care that we might have a regressive regulatory system? We seem to care about regressive tax systems. We don't want regressivity in tax systems. Should we, have, should we understand how regressive we are in our regulatory affairs? Um, for example, are Fortune 100 companies regulated different? I think they obviously have the means at that size to bear fixed costs that other firms don't. For example, internalizing lobbying or paying large K Street budgets. But this varies. And again, this happens. So we should measure it so we can at least make better decisions about where we want to go. So again, we, we're working on all of these things and, and a couple more that we'll hopefully have public soon. Um, we have these 10Ks at a high level as a data source. We'll be releasing this. Uh, as a data set that's updated quarterly with an index that you can cite and include in all of your econo econometric studies going forward. We have the first paper where we say, we've just landed on the surface of the moon. How warm is it? And what's the, the terrain like? And then we're starting to dig in and take some samples here and, and understand the, the types of animals or species or climates that we, we experience. So here's us. Roland already gave you the spiel. Lex Predict, uh, the Law Lab at Chicago Kent bunch of online material in our, our blog, which is over a decade, getting to a decade soon Almost here. Decade. So thank you. If you have any positive comments, direct them to me and otherwise. <laughs> I'll turn my back so you can stab me and I won't know. Go ahead. Uh, or, or are you including into your, uh, it's a fine line to obviously walk, not to get into some of these normative uh, issues. I think we want to. Well, well, some of these things are just objective things. Yeah, and I think we're trying to you know, we're trying to keep this as as objective as possible. I, as far as the interpretations go, some of the graphs are going to be apparent. Now, whether or not that's okay comes back to this question. If if society is just more complex, then maybe we just have more regulation. So at some point, we still need to baseline or normalize what we're seeing here to some measure of just what the world is. Maybe we don't have that, and this is the best that we get. But, but I think you're, you're asking some of the right questions. Um, any, uh, any proper policy uh, professor will teach you that policy is uh, analyzed in the context of normative agreement yeah, well, as to what the right answer is. And so unless. I have a normative framework. You have a normative framework. Like, there's no right or wrong unless we have a. Yeah. We're just saying okay. you can just extend a table. Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, and we will. And it'll be on and GitHub. Then you can do a prediction. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. When, when the, there's a, a change in the regulatory temperature, you know, what effect does that have on the change in the, you know, the, the bottom line of these well, companies? Well, so that's not normative. Right. I mean, so here's, a, here's an example. After, say, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, we see a consolidation of health plans, insurers, hospital groups, claims processors. We do. It's pretty well established, right, that the ACA has driven consolidation. So this is exactly the kind of stuff. That, honestly, our goal, get these three to five papers out, establish a framework that's at least the first step, open the data up, and then if you want to collaborate, or you, you, or you can just cite us. us. Yeah, we'll either way. Friends, but uh, <laughs> but I, I do think one, one thing just to, uh, to, put, to put in your head is that uh, um, uh, the challenge here is is to try to give a characterization and somewhat stay out of the underlying argument. You know, like part of it is people just sort of say there's too many rules or whatever. But the question that I'm very interested in is, is this regressivity, the, the regressive component, if you're an, an emerging company in an area? I mean, because this is kind of like my own take about regulation and one of the reasons we want to understand. If you're a large company, you can use the regulatory state to block entrance into the market, right? And so we're actually interested in the ways in which they pull levers, you know, as he was saying, you, if you're large, you have the ability to, you have a budget to be able to deploy K Street to block your competitors. We're particularly interested in the way that that plays out in this, in this particular context uh, versus, you know, a more open market. But, you know, this, this, is, uh, uh, this is my own personal interest. We're not really quite ready to answer that from where we are now, but if we think that we're, you know, this with some other data stream, we might be able to get, get some, uh, uh, some hook on that. Trading. I mean, there's many things, right? So we, to be fair, we, we do have a mind to commercialize a little bit of this, and there are other parties in the room who can do the same thing. We're obviously interested in talking, too. But, but um, it answers questions about burdens or about opportunities, mm -hmm. right? So I think, uh, I think it, it allows you maybe to look to emerging areas. It allows you to understand uh, maybe some arbitrage opportunities in the M&A space, for example. There's the obvious what companies are increasing risk that analysts haven't picked up on an approach for, for investment companies. So there's many different ways that you can take this information and, and try to commercialize it. In this context, wearing our academic hats, we just publish the results. We put everything we do on GitHub. And we'll, we'll plan to automate it quarterly. You can submit your pull requests, and we'll accept them with the, the code that improves the recall. And people can take it and put in an econometric study, a political economy study, a legal study. They can use it in annotated text generation. We don't think there's been nearly enough leveraged. I mean, this is a group of people collectively here at Codex that are interested in a lot of time. We don't feel like there's been enough done with this data set because it's a pretty rich. It, 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 it's, it's an avenue into a bunch of questions that I think people at this, uh, 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 you know, at this center are interested in. And, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe it's just an element of a bigger thing, that, or uh, several things you might pull together, but it, it's got so, uh, some interesting properties that I think you know, folks should think about uh, 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 you know, in this space. Yep. Uh, I think we had a question up there. Yeah. In your plot of the connection between companies. Yep. Can I get the, the uh, presenter back? Is it, is it F5 mm -hmm. to launch? Or? Is there a mouse I can use? Uh, this is going to be at the. There we go. Okay, the uh, the black background. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You're red. Uh, so there's there's big clusters, but there's also the vast majority of, of these are, are peripheral. And this is only the giant component. So there's stuff that's not even shown here because it's not even in the giant component. This is microclimates. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between here and San Francisco in terms of temperature. It's two different landscapes, right? I mean, the idea is that this whole idea, we have microclimates here. We have regu regulatory, we have sort of self-contained little climates, that's kind of what we're trying to evaluate, that are like different than the other places. And then here you have this sort of things that are all much more similar, but then you have this like, what's this? A little, a little isolated neighborhood over here that's more like each other than the rest of the stuff. So, so these are all the little microclimates. 
talking about regulation as a whole. Yes. No, that's right. That's what we're trying to say. Like, there's it plays out in different ways in different spaces. And it's inter you know, we're just getting started with this. But you know, you might ask yourself, who are these people? What are they? Why aren't they like the rest of these? And, and are there opportunities? Maybe you take the entity, you redomicile it, or you separate the business units, and so one business unit isn't subject to the unnecessary regulation that cascades across the entity. Yeah. Right. Plenty of stuff. One follow-up. Uh, does this indicate that any regulations are really focused on yes. like single companies? No, not that. Not that. Single business activities, I would say. Sometimes it's like you just have enough employees that you trigger a threshold, or you have enough employees that you generate enough OSHA risk that you need to disclose your OSHA risk because it meets a materiality threshold set by an accountant under FAS, FAS or uh, GAAP standards, right? So some of this stuff, again, size. And others are like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, again, is like unless you're mining or diverting water or something like that, you're not going to trigger the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. There's a Nuclear Power Energy Act, too, like so Duke or whoever's your nuclear uh, generator, the only people who are going to experience that. One, one other thing that we've talked a little bit about, and we haven't sorted it all out, is it's interesting to see if we see new speciation sort of going on. So a new, a new set of companies is sort of working in this weird intersection of different areas that they then trigger, that, that triggers changes in their 10K profile. We're actually saying that the, comp the nature of that business is actually changed in important ways. And, and it's pretty, you could ask, so there's different ways you could do this. You could ask analysts to qualitatively interpret that. Or you could say, hey, we actually have a way to kind of see a version of that, because if they have changed in their sort of new, new laws or rules in their, uh, uh, in their sort of uh, 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 windshield, that's kind of interesting, because you know, we say this a lot, like, this business wasn't a technology business, now it is. This business wasn't an X business, now it's a Y business. This might be a way to get a little bit of a window into that. Anyway, that's something we've talked a little about. I don't think we've totally sorted it out, but there's, we think there's something in there that's interesting along those lines. Are there dots in the clusters? Are those, like these? Let's say a dot in the cluster. Is that, is that an industry? Is it a company? It's a is firm. Business activity? Te technically, it's a. Okay. It, this, in this chart, it is both uh, one or at most typically two 10Ks. They can amend 10Ks, and some of the fiscal calendars don't line up, and so they may have two 10Ks in here. But this is the calendar year 2011. Exactly. Firm. Exactly. It's a firm. It's a one firm. This each one firm. each each node is one, one firm in one calendar year, which may be two, but it's generally only one filing. Okay. It's a little bit of a nuance. So the, bit, the reason that firms. they're clustered is because they're more similar than they are different. They're uh, closer to each other than they are to everybody else. That's why they cluster up like that. In the one or more 10Ks that each of these nodes had in the calendar year 2011, they shared more acts that they were regulated by with each other. Than with everything. other firms. That's what a micro. I mean, that's kind of our idea of the microclimate. This is a microclimate. These notes are more together than they are with all the rest of them. Okay, then what methodology should we follow in determining you know, that sort of the baseline that all companies have? So right? it's just, they, they get all, most of them reference yep. the Securities Act. Yep. We just and, threshold and so that. So it's out. a threshold that doesn't. It all otherwise would be a yarn ball. Yeah. So threshold. community detection and clustering are kind of. NP hard, they're more, or they're halfway art, halfway science. So we're not here to defend or, or get into that. But, but we're just, again, trying to put things into Linnaean classifications. We're not saying that that maps onto a perfect truth. But generally, I think we're using fast, greedy community detection Big with, or uh, yeah, so depending on the dendrogram or the um, visualization. But like this is, this is fast, greedy. Community detection, which is like Klaus at Newman, two thousand and three, or something like that, and uh, and edge weighted based on how many acts they share with each other. So, mm -hmm. so, so the uh, the uh, the clusters show similarity in yep. reference to the acts, and the the, uh, the broad lines connecting the clusters mm -hmm. show. So this is an interesting one that I like to look at. So clearly, all of this kind of pink chartreuse stuff is, uh, is, is one maybe sector or subsector. Or let's just use that word loosely. This yellow thing is something else that's slightly smaller, maybe another subsector. Maybe these are both in financial services, and these are broker-dealers, and these are broker-dealers that also have an FDIC-registered 
bank for customer deposits or something like all this consolidation that's gone on. They um, might have companies that kind of like span the gap that might be a little bit of both or they might be transitioning from this into that or vice versa. And so these really thick bands say every firm in this cluster also shares similarity with a firm in this cluster. And when you see something like this, again, it's clear that maybe there's, a, there's an A and a B, but you can be both A and B. And that's what gets you into this. I mean, it almost looks like a Venn diagram, right? Uh-huh, go ahead. Well, your, your introduction to the paper explains the application of the ecosystem metaphor quite well. What kind of metaphors do you use to use? Uh, not too many, to be honest. We do have a cutting board uh, of scraps. And uh, we looked at um, agencies. We looked at including other kinds of statutory or regulatory references. Right, you um, asked about CFRs. We don't see a yeah. ton of those. Yeah, we were surprised. Like, we actually went on based on your suggestion of looking at CFRs. And we, yeah. we, don't, we don't see nearly as many references to that. I think they just say, they cite the whole act and they just sort of say, and it's regular, and it's sort of follow on regulations. They tend to not identify specific CFRs. That was a surprise to us. Yeah, and we did look for like Treasure Egg, separate from Code of Federal Regulation 42, whatever. There, yeah. They're surprisingly few. It's, it's much more general. But I would say, I mean, we set out, we kind of had this moment where it was like, well, we could actually just count them, either unique acts per filing or all references. And that's pretty much all we need to answer this question, at least at, at first order. So um, like I said, we included other parts of the data and then ended up throwing them out. And we really focused on, so at least in the presentation, most of the discussion, we focused on acts as opposed to agencies understanding that they're obviously intertwined and interdependent in a way that we can't really separate when we come back to the policy question, but just for simplicity of presentation. Um, so we have a lot of different parts of the government that have a lot of different moving pieces. Um, we included a lot of those different parts, but at the end of the day, the acts were, were pretty much the simplest way to capture at least 80 plus percent of what's going on in them. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, there are places where that may or may not be seen depending on whether it's an agency that grants it. Now, I would say the anecdotal evidence is often that that happens through K Street redlining of acts or when an act is put forward in draft form, it turns out there's this if-else clause that happens to just coincidentally exempt whoever had the K Street attorney, exempt the telecom company that had this kind of in switching infrastructure because that's different than the other kind. So. Um, there are probably uh, notices of like non-action letters. There are these lighter touch, like the Treasury regulations that might be non-precedential private rulings or, or some kind of comments that clarify something. There's, for example, in FinTech right now, there's a lot of that going on. They're not statutory FinTech frameworks, but there's the Treasury or somebody saying, uh, we're kind of thinking this is mostly OK right now, and it's not statutory, but we're not going to come after you for now if you kind of do these three things. So I think it's probably pretty hard for us to get to. And one of the things, having spoken with regulators at some length, is they don't generally like to name firms when they're issuing that broader guidance. And they'd rather avoid this one-off special ruling where they just pick you, you're special, we write a ruling for you, especially because they're not precedential. And then when they do that, every other firm like them comes and says, give me a letter two, give me a letter two, give me a letter two. So it's easier to just kind of promulgate these soft regulatory documents that are in the Federal Register, but, but provide an insight into whether or not we'll take action against you, basically. Was that uh, Spotlight Foundation, maybe, or Sunlight Foundation? Gopher? Did you go for him? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. OK. 
we could look for that and see, because in some cases they may have actually said, and we've now been, since last quarter, exempted from this. Um, so uh, it goes on, for sure. So, mm -hmm. Dirk? There are patterns, yeah. yeah. So that would be one way of clearing the data, of leaving it, um, to figure out whether there are just some firms, or journeys, or whatever, um, that has, have a preference for a given particular tax. Much of it is is actually not done by attorneys these days. It's done more so by the big four, accounting like the accounting firms, professional services firms that don't do law. They don't do law, yeah. right? Not in the US, at least. But um, I would say they're. They're, they have to be named, especially in the last 10 years or so. You have to have an auditor, and now maybe your auditor has to change too, and then you have to have other kinds of audits, and maybe you have to have independence of some kind, and maybe they mess up picking the card that they're supposed to announce the winner of. And so, um, herd, there's tends to be some herding in the way. So if, uh, if your other folks in your sector tend to reference it, you tend to reference it too. And certainly, if, if you look at the time, if, if everybody in your sector referenced it and you did it in a year, then by the next year you're going to do it. So there is a little bit of that hurrying effect, which is driving a little bit of that dynamic, but also it's because you sort of look around and you say, now we don't even know about the informal version of this, where people know the, their counterparties and it's, you know, there's a sort of notion of what's out there that, that's going to affect their business. So that, that we don't know about, but officially you sort of see this. You know, uh, the, uh, uh, now one thing you can sort of see is who's the market leader in terms of the lawyers? Which person is the person who seems to go first, if ever? Because uh, sometimes you'll see some companies that are out in front of others in terms of, you might call it over-disclosing, but you have lots of reasons to want to do this disclosure because you, you're sort of avoiding securities fraud lawsuits. Uh, so you, anyway, there's, there's, that would be an interesting sort of paper in its own right, kind of leading awesome. corporate lawyers or something. Where's the Wachtell USB drive? Yes, there's a Wachtell <laughs> USB drive. That's to plug them. <laughs> Yeah, we have time. Craig, Craig said uh, 5.30, so if we leave by 4.30, we're okay. Do you know any folks from the SEC piece of this? Mm -hmm. Because I think the other piece is the tax piece. Right? There was a business article the other day on the, the influx of lobbying that will happen again once the tax code comes up for a change. Yeah. In any time now. So there's right. a whole other piece of the blockade that there is. We don't have 86, right, because the SEC didn't have Edgar. Carl Malamud, not here today, but didn't have Edgar up and running for us in, in 86 with that IRC reform. But there have been a couple, obviously, smaller reforms maybe we could learn from. I'm well, very but, interested. This is like a little side project, I think, is to yeah. say, what are these companies saying about the Trump effect more generally? They're going to say stuff in the 10 case about it. Yeah. And that his presidency is going to be helpful to some of them and harmful to others, but it's things that the market ought to, ought to be disclosed to the market if you're a corporate, you know, if you're the general counsel of the company, better make some forward-looking statement about what does the Trump presidency mean to our business. Again, it might not all be, it'd be interesting to see. What's very cool about it is you're getting somebody who has a legal obligation essentially to do this to actually give you a market analysis of what they think it means for their, for their own situation. And again, I could just hire, we could hire an analyst and have an analyst do the same thing, but they don't have the same obligations that these folks do. I, I just think, that we just think that's a kind of fun project and it's not we were talking.